Entropy going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT and DAT and OAT prep. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the rest of this school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so we're covering a rather complex topic in this lesson, and that is the topic of entropy. And the last lesson we kind of uh, talked about that entropy is correlated with randomness or disorder, but it's not the same thing. It's not equivalent to randomness or disorder. And uh, but suffice to say, we will use that as a kind of a, a working correlation so that when we start talking about how we can predict whether a process involves an increase or decrease in entropy, that increase or decrease in randomness will prove helpful. Uh, in that process. So well, let's first talk about what it is. So a couple of different ways to look at it. And we're going to start with a, a, a way of looking at it from statistical mechanics. So in entropy, abbreviated by the letter S here, uh, it turns out is related to what we call the number of microstates. Uh, and here, omega uh, is sometimes used instead of W here. So you might see this also written a little bit different. You might see K, B, LN, omega, so, or some combination thereof. So W here or omega here stands for what we call the number of microstates. And it's just the number of unique states that a system can exist in. And so it turns out more microstates is gonna be associated with more entropy. As W gets larger and larger and larger here, you get more and more microstates, you get more and more entropy, it turns out as well. And then you get the special case where there's only one microstate. If a system has exactly one state in which it consists, one of these microstates, well, the natural log of one is zero. And so that is when that system is going to have zero entropy. So we can also look uh, down here as well. We've got the K, and, and so we don't confuse that with the rate constant, lowercase k. Uh, lowercase k sub b is the Boltzmann constant. And your Boltzmann constant, you might see it K or just KB, is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. So, and it turns out if you multiply this by Avogadro's number, so you'll get that universal gas constant we've dealt with a time or two, that 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And so this comes up uh, in a couple different places. It's kind of like, the, you know, the universal gas constant is for an entire mole of a substance, whereas the Boltzmann's constant is for an individual atom or an individual molecule of a substance. All right, so talking about this and relating it back to microstates again, so... In the last lesson, we talked about how when you cool a substance down, if you cool it all the way down to absolute zero Kelvin for a perfect crystal, it will have zero entropy. And the reason comes down to, at least from a statistical mechanics perspective, is that when you cool it all the way down to absolute zero, that substance will only have a single microstate in which it can exist. So it turns out there's only going to be, you know, all the, all the atoms are going to kind of have the, the least amount of motion they could possibly have in fitting into the exact well-defined crystal lattice positions in that perfect crystal. And that's the only microstate. There's no impurities. And we'll find out that impurities can add a lot of microstates in a hurry, but with no impurities, there's only one state at which that substance can exist. And as a result, with the natural log of one being zero, that substance has zero entropy. And that's our third law of thermodynamics. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, entropy, this, this weird thing, we're, we're like, okay, so entropy comes down to these microstates. How does this, you know, correlate to disorder or randomness? Well, you know, systems that tend to have more disorder or randomness have more microstates in which they can exist. So take, for example, let's say I've got a crystal lattice where all of a sudden now I've got nine atoms in this crystal lattice and they're all identical. And so being all identical, as long as these guys aren't moving around or anything like that, this is a single microstate at which this can exist. Now, if you look, as you increase the temperature, you're going to find out that these guys start vibrating a little faster. And all of a sudden, they're all in there's different, vibra you know, different vibrational states or, or different, you know, let's say locations during their vibrations. And so all of a sudden, it starts, the more they're vibrating, the more you're going to start having some of these in slightly different positions. And all of a sudden, the more atoms you have and the more of the different positions, and all of a sudden, you get many more microstates in which this can exist and therefore more entropy. The other thing you might have happen is if you introduce an impurity. And let's say even at zero Kelvin, I put one different atom in the mix here. And all of a sudden, well, in this particular crystal, I could have put that one atom in any one of nine different positions. And all of a sudden now for this particular 
uh, composition for this crystal, there are now nine different microstates. And so nine different microstates is going to correspond to now significantly more entropy when there was only one microstate when all the atoms were identical. And so turns out that mixtures have more entropy than pure substances, and that mixing tends to be a spontaneous process as a result because it leads to this increase in entropy. Uh, and at the very least, we can say that uh, mixing substances tends to lead to an increase in entropy at the very least. We'll talk about spontaneity uh, in that regard a little bit later in this chapter. Cool. So that's about as much as I want to get into this statistical uh, mechanics definition. Uh, again, the big thing you should really take away is that the more microstates, the more entropy for a particular system. Now, one other thing to note, this is kind of the statistical mechanics perspective look at entropy. Uh, you could also look at it from classical thermodynamics, and classical thermodynamics defines the change in entropy. So as the heat transferred for a reversible process divided by the temperature in Kelvin. It's a mathematical definition for entropy for classical thermodynamics. And I'm not even going to cover this. This is kind of, you know, beyond what you need to know for a typical general chemistry course. Uh, I have a, a course on chadsprep.com. It's free to view for uh, an elementary physical chemistry. And this elementary physical chemistry course is kind of an entire semester of thermodynamics. And I definitely go into entropy in more detail there, including this lovely definition right here and kind of some calculus behind it as well. But uh, if you notice, then this is kind of interesting because most of the time students are going to associate entropy as being the same exact thing as disorder or randomness. And again, we said that it's not equivalent to that. It just correlates with disorder randomness. When you start looking at the actual definitions, whether you look at the, the definition from the perspective of statistical mechanics or from classical thermodynamics, uh, you know, these are mathematical definitions. So, however, once again, it turns out that as there gets more ent uh, more randomness or disorder introduced into a system, there will be more uh, entropy as well, regardless of how you kind of take a look at these. So, uh, oftentimes it's just easier to kind of, you know, kind of gloss over the distinction between entropy and randomness or disorder, and it's just easier to tell students that they're one and the same. But just keep in mind, they're not one and the same, but they definitely are typically correlated with each other, and we'll take advantage of that here in just a little bit. So, so let's talk about some of the factors affecting entropy here for just a sec. All right, so the first factor affecting entropy is phase. So solid versus liquid versus gas. And, and oftentimes, this is probably the most pronounced uh, factor that's going to affect entropy here. And uh, it turns out that solids have the least amount of entropy. And if you look at a, a typical solid, again, we kind of drew a crystal structure. You've got the atoms or molecules in well-defined positions. Now, as you increase the temperature, they might vibrate a little bit more. And so those positions become a little less well-defined. But if you compare that to a liquid where the atoms and molecules are just moving around and are not in any kind of well-defined crystal structure, and then you compare that even uh, you know, further to the gas, where now you've got the atoms and molecules moving around, they're spread out, and they're moving far faster. And now you have even more potential locations and microstates possible. So, but you find out that the solids have the most order or the least amount of disorder, and therefore associated with the lowest amount of entropy. After that becomes the liquids, and then after that comes the gases with the most entropy. And it turns out that entropy is going to be very volume dependent. And when you go from a liquid to a gas in a kind of normal atmospheric conditions, you get a huge increase in volume. So, uh, you know, to the order of like 10 to the fourth power. So like a, uh, an increase of like 1,000 to 10,000 fold increase in volume, and you get a significant in increase in entropy when you boil something, when it goes from liquid to gas. So solids have a little bit of entropy, liquids a little more, and then gas is significantly more entropy. And so we'll find out uh, uh, in the next section here in this lesson um, that looking at the number of moles of gas is one of the best ways to kind of get a, a gauge on whether a reaction involves an increase or a decrease in entropy because uh, gases have so much more entropy than liquids or solids. All right, so that first one is phase. Uh, second one is going to be temperature. So, and, and again, a higher temperature is going to lead to more entropy. So, and, and the reason this is that a higher temperature, you just might want to think of more molecular motion, faster molecular motion. And so, whether it's in a solid phase, where again, the atoms or molecules are in kind of well-defined crystal positions, but again, the higher the temperature, the more they're going to vibrate around. And so, 
by vibrating around more, around more and more, there's more locations where you can find the, any given atom. And then, you know, multiply that by all the atoms in that crystal. And now the different combinations of locations, you know, grows quickly. And so you get an, a, a bunch more micro states and more entropy associated with that. In the liquid phase and the gas phase, you also get uh, more molecular motion within the liquid or within the gas at higher temperatures uh, as well. And keep in mind, we kind of looked at the, the opposite. Instead of increasing the temperature, we looked at decreasing the temperature with that third law of thermodynamics. And if you decrease it all the way down to absolute zero, where there's essentially no heat anymore, you get zero entropy. So definitely a correlation between temperature and entropy. All right, third thing we should look at is volume. So, and again, greater volume leads to greater entropy, and this is most apparent for gases. So, but kind of think about this. So let's say I told you uh, we're going to do a, uh, we're going to, I'm going to hide a $1 million gold coin. Uh, I guess, I don't know how big of a gold coin that would really be, but uh, maybe a rather large gold coin, or maybe it's a rare coin or something. I don't know, but I'm going to hide a rather large gold coin, and I'm going to hide it in my office here. And my office is like a 10 by 11 room. It's not huge, so but it's a little messy right now. So there are some places it could definitely hide. So would it be worth your time if I said, if you can find it, you can keep it? Would you start searching around my office? Well, probably so. And you probably ransack my office, but eventually there's not just, there's only so many locations where I can hide that gold coin, you're probably going to find it eventually. But if I told you I hid it somewhere in North America, should you just, you know, uh, abandon everything you're doing and go start searching for this gold coin if you have no idea where in North America it is? No. With, you know, the idea is that, you know, the bigger the volume, the more locations the atoms and molecules can be. And same thing here, the bigger the volume here of where I've hidden this gold coin, the less likely it becomes that you're going to find it because there's more locations I could have hidden it. So that's kind of the idea is when you increase the volume, you get more locations for each individual molecule and therefore more possible microstates for the molecules in that system and therefore more entropy. So entropy is definitely volume dependent. So the last factor here is going to be the number of particles in the system. And it turns out the more particles, the more entropy or randomness in that system. So the more micro states it's going to have based on the number of particles. So go back here and let's just take our crystal back from nine. So to just four atoms or molecules. And again, even in the crystal, depending on the temperature, these might be vibrating around a little bit. And so I've got four different atoms that can all have four slightly different locations. And depending on if this is vibrating left and right or up and down or forward and backward. So there's a lot of different possible orientations of these four different atoms or molecules just based on how they're vibrating together. But you know, if I start adding more and more, now all of a sudden I've got nine different atoms that are all vibrating together and there's now a, a significantly greater number of possible sets of locations for all nine atoms at the same time and a lot more microstates associated with that. And so the more particles you get, the more sets of you know different locations they can all be located at at the same time is one way to look at it. Although it's not purely just location as we'll see. So, uh, but in this case, we could look at it that way. And uh, so the greater number of particles, the greater the entropy as well. And so uh, in chemistry, it's quite common not just to look at the number of particles, but sometimes at the macro level, the number of moles of particles. And so more moles of a substance can lead to more entropy as well. Cool. So these are the most common factors affecting entropy. Uh, and it, we kind of look at this in, in the context of a system, but you can also look at this in the context of atoms or molecules or compounds and stuff like this. And let's say I had one mole of a variety of different compounds. And let's just say I had some helium, I had some hydrogen, and then I'm going to have some methanol. I have one mole of each, or let's say just one atom or molecule of each or something like this. And well, if you take a look at helium, helium's a single atom, it's a sphere. And if you take that sphere and you rotate it around vertically or horizontally this way, so or horizontally this way, uh, it doesn't matter. It's a sphere the whole time. It's, it's like a perfect cue ball. Think of that white ball in billiards. So it's a perfect cue ball. And as you rotate it around, uh, unless you're looking, unless it's got some mark on it or something, you actually can't tell that it's rotating because it looks the same all the time you're rotating it. And so as we get a little more complexity here, so instead of just a sphere, with H2, you've now got two spheres attached to each other. And notice if you rotate it around this direction, you'd actually notice those 
that molecule rotating around. And if you rotated it in the plane of the board around this way, you'd notice it spinning around as well. However, if you were rotating it in this fashion, so out and into the board, you wouldn't notice it rotating at all. And so now all of a sudden we've gone from a single sphere, which no matter which way you rotate it, you can't tell the difference. And so there's only one micro state associated with, you know, with rotation in, in a general sense. Whereas now two out of the three different planes or axes that you rotate it, you can tell the difference. And so as a result, this molecule we'd say has a little more complexity associated with it. So two atoms instead of one. So and as a result, it ends up with more entropy as it has more possible microstates associated with it. Sometimes with this uh, idea of rotation, we talk about degrees of freedom, and I'm not going to go too heavy into that. But again, if you take a look at my elementary physical chemistry course at chadsprep.com, I definitely cover it there. So, and then finally, we've got CH3OH here. And so CH3OH, you've got a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. That's then bonded to an oxygen, which is bonded to a hydrogen. So, and again, all these atoms are a little bit different. And so it turns out we're gonna got a little more complexity in this molecule than we did with the hydrogen molecule or with the helium atom. So and as a result, we got you know different things that can happen here. So it turns out one, we can rotate this now in all three dimensions and it looks different as you're rotating it and you can tell the difference. But also it turns out even some of the bonds in here can rotate as well. And so as it, you know, the bonds rotate, you're also seeing some different microstates that can exist as well. And all of a sudden, as you get more atoms in a molecule and more variety of atoms, you get more complexity and more entropy associated with that as well. And so if I said, which of these three substances, assuming I have an equal number of moles or an equal number of particles, atoms, molecules, whatever you wanna say, uh, of each, which one has the most entropy? Well, the one that's most complex has the most entropy, and that would be the CH3OH, the methanol in this case. And that's one of the kind of questions you might get is just, which of the following has the most entropy? And notice, we're not talking about entropy changes yet, but just again, the most entropy, which again, we're, we're kind of relating to the greatest number of microstates in which it can exist. So now we've got to talk about entropy changes though. So now we'll talk about how to predict the sign of delta S, whether it's positive or negative, or in some cases, maybe you won't know, but you'll know it's close to zero. The single biggest factor is the number of moles of gas. So we, we said uh, just a little bit ago that gases have significantly more entropy than an equivalent number of particles or moles than either the corresponding liquid or a corresponding solid. So a lot more entropy in gases, and as a result, you can kind of ballpark any chemical reaction by just looking to see are we getting more moles of gas or less moles of gas? So, and as you go from reactants to products, if there's an overall increase in the number of moles of gas, well then delta S is positive. So if you get more gas, delta S is positive. And if you get less gas, then delta S would be negative. So increase in the number of moles of gas. And so again, we can pretty much ignore the solids and the liquids. They're not gonna contribute much. It's really all about the number of moles of gas. They have so much more entropy that the solids and liquids largely aren't gonna make a, you know, any significant contribution, at least as far as predicting the sign, as long as there is a change in moles of gas. And so you get an increase in number of moles of gas, delta S is positive, decrease in moles of gas, delta S is negative. And if there is no change in the number of moles of gas, you have the same number of moles of gas on the reactant side and the product side in the reaction, well, at least from this metric, you're not gonna know whether delta S is positive or negative, but what you can say is it's probably not all that positive or all that negative. It's probably gonna be somewhat close to zero. All right, if you've got no change in the number of moles of gas, the second criteria to look for is your phase changes. So we learned all our phase changes back in chapter five and just a quick review here. So you've got solid to liquid to gas or solid to gas. And you might recall that solid to liquid is melting or fusion. Liquid to gas is boiling or vaporization and solid to gas is sublimation. But all of these involve, uh, all three of these uh, phase changes involve going from a more ordered or less disordered phase to a more disordered or less ordered phase. And they all correspond to an increase in entropy. So delta S is positive for all three of these phase changes. Now, we also learned back then that they're all endothermic as well, and so delta H is also positive. And I'll reference these in the next lesson. We're talking about some relationships between delta H and delta S and spontaneity. And uh, I'll reference back to these phase changes having both a positive value for delta H and a positive value for delta S, and we'll draw a conclusion from that. Now we can also look at the exact three opposite processes.
And so for your three opposite phase changes here, so liquid to solid, so that is freezing or crystallization, gas to liquid is condensation, and then gas to solid is either deposition or vapor deposition. And all of these are going from a phase that has more disorder to a phase with more order, and so we're losing entropy. And so for all three of these phase changes, delta S is going to be negative. We also learned back in chapter five that these are all exothermic processes. And so delta H is negative as well. And once again, next lesson, I'll reference back to this. And so for these three phase changes, delta H and delta S are both negative. And once again, we'll draw a conclusion from that later on. All right, so if there's no change in the number of moles of gas and you're not doing a phase, oh, actually, before we move on, there's one other phase change we wanna talk about. So, and let's say you've got sodium chloride and you dissolve it in water and it becomes aqueous. So in going from solid to aqueous, for almost any substance you're likely to encounter in this class, that's gonna be associated with more randomness and disorder. So in solid sodium chloride, they're in a nice crystal structure, well-defined crystal lattice positions, but once you dissolve them in water, the, the sodium cations and chloride anions are free to float around in the solution. They're moving around. There's a lot more randomness and disorder and more microstates associated with that and therefore more entropy. Now we'll find out uh, uh, if you take a, a biochemistry class, there's some really important exceptions to this kind of thing where sometimes if there's certain things you dissolve in water uh, that aren't, you know, that typically don't like water, like mixing oil in water or something like this, it turns out that they actually don't have a positive entropy change associated with them dissolving in water. But for most things you're likely to encounter in this class, like most salts, for sure, delta S is definitely going to be positive when they dissolve in water. All right, now we'll move on. And again, if there's no change in the number of moles of gas in a reaction or process, and we're not doing a phase change in any way, shape, or form, then complexity might be the last thing we look at. And this one's a little bit nebulous. Um, so, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's not always the easiest thing to recognize, but we did talk about the complexity in molecules. And so sometimes it can come down to that, where you end up with simpler molecules forming an equal number of more complex molecules. So, and so sometimes it can come down to that, but again, you're only ever gonna resort to looking at this if the first two, uh, and there's no difference or no uh, appreciable change or involved in the first two. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. And so let's, we're gonna look at some examples here of different reactions and processes and talk about what the sign for delta S is gonna be. All right, so we're gonna look at three reactions here and then one picture. I'm um, gonna describe, based on these three reactions, if delta S is positive or negative, or if we just can't tell. And so if we look, the first thing we should look for is a change in the number of moles of gas. And so if we look at this first one, it definitely involves gases. And we've got two moles of solid, one mole of gas on the reactant side. And the important part is I don't care about the solid, just one mole of gas. So, and it's becoming two moles of gas. And so if one mole of gas becomes two moles of gas, that's an increase in the number of moles of gas and therefore an increase in entropy. Cool, a lot of students get this one wrong. They'll look and be like, well, you got three particles turning into two particles. Well, again, before you look at the number of particles, the phase is the most important thing in, in many cases, especially at least uh, as long as uh, gas is involved. And so the change in the number of moles of gas, by far the most important factor and the first thing you should look for. Now in the next one here, where well, this one doesn't even involve gases, and so the first criterion here is not gonna help us. However, this is a phase change, this is freezing. So the liquid has more disorder, more entropy than the solid. So we're going from more entropy to less entropy, and therefore delta S here is now going to be negative. So you gotta know your phase changes and which ones are associated with uh, an increase in entropy and which ones are associated with a decrease in entropy. Same thing on the next one here. Another phase change, but not the more common ones, but uh, an ionic solid dissolving in water to become aqueous. And again, solid to aqueous, just like we saw with NaCl, definitely an increase in entropy. And so delta S is positive. And, and for the last one, there's a picture on the, the study guide if you have that in front of you, but I'll put it up on the screen. Here we're going from pure neon and pure argon separated by a wall. And then we're gonna take that wall out. So, and after you take that wall out, they're just gonna to mix together. And once they mix together, you now have more disorder, more randomness, more microstates that are possible, and therefore more entropy. And so typically when substances mix together, you might look at this as a, a increase in complexity a little bit maybe, so in the system, but really it comes down to an increase in the number of microstates and therefore an increase in entropy. Cool, so entropy is one of those 
subjects that's a little bit complicated and sometimes we dumb it down. So, but the truth is this, even this treatment's a little bit uh, uh, brief. And again, you can spend an entire chapter on just talking about entropy like I do in my elementary physical chemistry course. Um, so there's really even more to it than we're going through here, but hopefully you got a little better idea of what it is now. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment let me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you are looking for general chemistry practice on thermodynamics or anything else in general chemistry, take a look at my general chemistry master course. So free trial is available. I'll leave a link in the description. Happy studying.